Happy New Year 2017. Hey, this is Trevor Seven, and it is January 1st, which is an odd day to start the year. I think December 25th or March 21st would make much more sense. But since we've lost touch with Earth, Moon, and Sun, and we're stuck with our Gregorian calendar, uh, Happy New Year! <laughs> Instead of kicking off the year with the normal Psychokinesis compilation video, I thought I would put together a brief documentary using video clips that I found here on YouTube, to which you can find links uh, in the video description below. And just kind of document the origins and history of telekinesis in regard to its relation with the scientific community. Just kind of go over where we got started, where we've been, where we're at now, and where we're headed for the future. And my hopes for the future in 2017 is that we can just move beyond this realm of opinions and beliefs and get past the simple question of whether or not psychokinesis is real and get on with the business of uh, nurturing and cultivating these abilities and figuring out how we can use them to improve the quality of life for everyone on Earth. So I hope this little documentary is helpful for anyone who is still wondering whether or not psychokinesis is real and are in need of some scientific validation because the research is there. We've been studying psychokinesis for well over a century and we don't dedicate 100 years of research on something that's not real. So I hope 2017 is the year that everyone discovers their psychokinetic abilities and that we can get our, our thoughts and our intentions focused on a massive scale and make some really positive changes in 2017. All right, I want to thank all of my subscribers and viewers, and I appreciate you guys watching and sticking with me for yet another year. And I want to wish you all the best in 2017. This is Trevor Seven. Good day, God bless, and namaste. The same energy fields that enable people like Ingo Swan to leave their body and travel through space are thought to be responsible for causing objects to move. This rare talent for moving objects by force of will alone has been termed psychokinesis or PK. Ninel Kulagina is a Russian housewife who has this ability. These films of her demonstrating PK were made in a Russian hotel room and smuggled out of the country by American researchers. She gets the object moving with gestures of her hands or by fixating the object with nothing more than her eyes. Kulagina has been studied intensively for more than 10 years by Professor Sergeyev of Leningrad University, who has reported on her work. According to the Soviet view, PK is not accomplished by mind over matter, but rather by mind over force field. The Soviets claim they've already devised machines that create magnetic and other kinds of artificial fields that increase psychic powers, particularly telepathy and PK. According to Dr. Ravitz, in the 1951 Yale Journal of Biology and Medicine, the action of the sun and moon also affects the body's force field. Dr. Sergeyev agrees. The most favorable time for PK is during magnetic disturbances of the earth caused by sunspot activity. What is beginning to emerge is a new picture of the human being, not an alienated creature, but a being enmeshed in an ebb and flow with everyone and everything around him. The pulsing magnetic fields of machines, earth, moon, sun, the thoughts and emotions of ourselves and other people all affect the energy fields of our bodies and in turn, the Russians say, our psychic powers. In 1976, Robert John, then Dean of the School of Engineering of Princeton University, received an unusual request from a student. She wanted to study the effects of human intention on a mechanical device, a random event generator, to test for effects outside conventional physical theory and in the realm of psychokinesis. John supervised the project. Clearly it was not a usual topic for an undergraduate engineering independent project. 
and it was not a subject that I had any background in from a scholarly standpoint. So actually what I did was gave her the challenge of convincing me over the course of a couple of months of summer effort that there was enough substance to the topic to make it uh, viable for an undergraduate independent project. And she did that. It was, she was serious enough about it that we could go forward. At that point, I had to face, first of all, the possibility that there was substance to the topic. And secondly, that if one could confirm this in a more rigorous program, uh, that it would have substantial implications for the present and future practice of high technology. And so began the Pear Laboratory. After hiring Brenda Dunn as lab manager in 1979, investigations began in earnest. And over many years of trials and many kinds of random devices, the Pear Lab has demonstrated, to a highly significant degree, that the human mind has a small but measurable influence on random physical systems. A lot of what we've learned about the phenomena tends to be what it's not. Uh, what we can say for sure is that the phenomena are real. They are not chance fluctuations. Something is going on. There is a subtle ordering process that is influencing these otherwise random events. To the extent that one can summarize, what we find is that the uh, human mind and the information processing machines seem to be entering into some sort of a dialogue which influences both the machine and uh, the human mind that is interacting with it. The data that has engaged John and Dunn for close to 30 years comes from two different classes of experiment. The first class is based on a similar idea to that of the original student project. According to statistics, if you flip a coin 10 times, you would expect to get five heads. If you got six heads, you wouldn't think much of it. But if you flip the coin 10 million times and got six million heads, you would know that some process was having an influence on the outcome. This machine does 200 flips per second. When left unattended, it performs in a statistically normal way. And over time, it approximates a chance mean of 100. But when an operator is present, wishing for the output to be higher or lower, the output deviates very slightly from the chance expectation. A little shift to the right. So all of our devices share the features that they are based on some form of random physical process as their source. They are capable of calibration and in most cases, they're capable of a theoretical expectation. Well, how do you go through the scientific process of peer review and et cetera, et cetera, if you can't have peers, if you're not allowed to present the data and you're not allowed to deal with it critically on a rational scientific level? So you end up getting irresponsible criticism. You end up getting um, uh, unreasonable rejection, not on the basis of the quality of the work, but on the topical matter. Uh, in my view, that's not science. That's not what science is about. Science is about opening your mind to learn something new. It's not saying, this is something I don't want to hear about. This is the sort of thing, as one critic said, I wouldn't believe in even if it was true. Uh, all of these things, of course, are challenging. Uh, any attempts to model them, because these these things just don't fit with our, our prevailing understanding of the way the world works. Compounding the results across all of our experiments, all of the time we have been operating, you then come out saying that the results you find in this composite database are unlikely by chance to better than one part in 10 to the 12th. That's one part in a trillion. This is far more stringent than any science experiment I'm aware of requires for its validation. So much of Pear's effort has been toward trying to demonstrate, trying to convince, trying to make the case that the phenomena are real. 
the, the, the next level of inquiry is, okay, they're real. What are they? How do they work? Where do they apply? I think Pear has done what Pear had to do. There's just so many random binary events that you can generate. If we haven't made our point with the databases we've accumulated over the last quarter century, we're not going to make it. But to take it further, to talk about the implications and how that may affect other fields, that's for the next generation to do. These experiments, technically speaking, are not difficult. The phenomena, conceptually speaking, are extraordinarily difficult. If indeed, as we contend, these events are intrinsically, subjectively driven, then it follows clearly that the researcher must be experiencing them himself. So don't take our word for it, don't take others' words for it, go off and try it yourself and come to your own conclusions based on your own experience. Telekinesis is the human ability to move objects of various mass without contact. There are many people in the world who can demonstrate something of the sort, and even fewer can teach others to do this. In 2008, in Russia, a world record was registered in the nomination of the largest community of people who in the shortest possible time were taught telekinesis. At that point, there were 250 such people, and today there are thousands. The effect was confirmed many times on television, as well as by known foreign scientists and researchers. Сегодня людей, обладающих необъяснимыми способностями, становится все больше. В Санкт-Петербургском институте биосенсорной психологии учат делать чудеса всех желающих. Настоящих целителей, по крайней мере, имеющих диплом экстрасенсов, тоже найти несложно. Например, в ассоциациях и институтах. Будущих экстрасенсов и в городе, и на выездных занятиях в первую очередь учат телекинезу. Например, усилием воли вращать бумажную спираль, подвешенную на нитке в стеклянной колбе, или отклонять магнитную стрелку. Друзья, наконец-то в нашей студии появился гость, который внесет немножко научного направления в наши прозношатающиеся мысли. Это Владимир Тонков, президент Института биосенсорной психологии. Потому что такого увидеть практически больше нигде и никогда невозможно. Эти люди, обладающие сверхъестественными способностями, практически одной только силой мысли приводят движение предмета на расстояние. Внимательно следите за руками. Они еще и приводят движение стрелки компаса. Чуть позже эти уникальные люди появятся у нас в студии и в прямом эфире на ваших глазах продемонстрируют свои возможности. In terms of skills, skills wise, you know, there were so many things, fun stuff that I learned. Um, there's telekinesis, there's um, being able to control it, being able to move multiple objects, being able to move bigger and bigger objects, being able to move different kinds of objects, being able to move different objects in different ways, to be able to turn them, to be able to pull them, to be able to push them, to be able to rotate them, to be able to move them across surfaces. Um, these, are, these are just some telekinetic, telekinetic skills. These people attend the Institute of Biosensory Psychology. The founder of the institute and the chief specialist, Vladimir Tonkov, has been teaching unusual abilities to ordinary people for about 25 years. Serious research in telekinesis started back in the times of the USSR. In the 1980s, a group of scientists in physics, headed by Professor Gennady Dulnev, a PhD in technical science, conducted many experiments with the famous Ninel Kulagina on registering the phenomenon of telekinesis. In the experiments, Kulagina was to produce an influence on an analytical scale. Under her influence, the scale lowered and registered a maximum of 100 milligrams. When the scale was covered by a glass cap, the effect remained. In another experiment, the operator was to move an object placed inside a Faraday cup screening electromagnetic fields. The object was moved successfully. This led to the conclusion that telekinesis was not of an electromagnetic nature. Later, 
Under the guidance of Professor Dulnev, more experiments were conducted, proving that the nature of telekinesis is not related to gravity, electrostatics, acoustics, or heat, and so on. At the beginning of the 2000s, the Institute of Biosensory Psychology and its chief specialist and founder of biosensory psychodisciplines, Vladimir Tonkov, undertook the task of creating the conditions for obtaining unambiguous proof that a material component of our psyche does exist, that it is capable of influencing physical objects and subjects, and that this ability is not unique, but rather that it is inherent in everyone. At the first stage of research, which took years, the task was for everyone in the group without exception to reveal in themselves the ability to move objects without contact. The group was successful in achieving this task, thereby proving that there is nothing exclusive about learning contactless movement of objects and that there is no predisposition to it, that this is an ability of every person without exception. In the years that followed, this conclusion has been confirmed by other study participants at the Institute. The result of this work was noted in the Russian Book of Records and Achievements and was also sent to the Guinness Book of Records in the fall of 2008 as a world record in the nomination of the largest community of people who in the shortest possible time were taught telekinesis, the contactless movement of objects. Dr. Dean Radin is one of the world's foremost researchers into psychic phenomena. He is chief scientist of the Institute of Noetic Sciences and has held appointments at Princeton University, the University of Edinburgh and SRI International, where he worked on a classified program investigating psychic phenomena. He spoke to the Eternities podcast about his latest book, Supernormal, Science, Yoga and the Evidence for Extraordinary Psychic Abilities, of which one reviewer claimed, it reveals how we can awaken to innate human potentials that are glorious. I began by asking him about these potentials and how we might awaken them. Simply the idea that we have inherent potentials which are not being used. Um, I think most people most of the time don't have much uh, attention paid on the fact that they're, they may not be doing the best that they can do. Uh, and of course people who do any kind of discipline training, whether it's meditation or in sports or learning a language or whatever, uh, you, you can learn new things, sometimes dramatically new. Uh, but here we're talking about almost being human plus, as you say in your novel. It's being going beyond what we ordinarily think of as human and something quite advanced, say. And for other people, that what, what I'll say then about our potentials is not so new or even that exciting because they live in those states. What I'm talking about are primarily are uh, the whole variety of psychic experiences and psychic abilities that uh, can be trained. And if for somebody who believes that they are psychic already, this, this is, comes as no news. But, uh, but I'm talking more about uh, training to a level that we generally don't see very often, uh, that are historically described, but but not so not so often in the modern world. Uh, and so those, these potentials are what we think of as ordinary psychic stuff, like telepathy and clairvoyance and so on, but at a much much better degree uh, of precision and robustness than what we typically see in today's world. Scientists are uh, excited and they've done many studies and that has led actually to pretty good advancement in our understanding of at least some of the abilities of the mind, namely things like uh, if you are a disciplined meditator then 
uh, the morphology and the function of your brain will change and change quickly. For example, the, you'll, you'll end up getting uh, more gray matter yeah. in the cortex or in the brain. You can change, you're literally changing the shape as a result of exercising what amounts to a muscle that, that you don't normally use. So in the same way that your biceps will increase if you start doing curls, uh, your, your brain changes as a result of, of what you do. Uh, basically, all of the, the, the classic psychic phenomena, whether it's telepathy or clairvoyance, precognition, psychokinesis, uh, and, and a little bit on survival issues. Uh, I've done research in all of those areas. In, in each case, uh, because there are no curriculum, I mean, you can't go to a university and learn how to do this stuff, so there's, there's no career track. I essentially had to uh, had reinvent the wheel by looking at what other people had done and then try to advance the, the state of the art as well. Uh, what I've been doing in the past mm, 10 years or so, uh, mainly at IONS, is looking at uh, what we call DMILS, which is a, a modern version of the word BioPK. It's, it's psychokinetic effects on living systems at a distance. So we've looked at uh, effects of intention on the cell cultures, on human physiology, uh, on food, and on water. And Interesting. in all cases, we, we find that there are effects. They, they tend to be quite small in terms of absolute magnitude, but the effects are real, and we see that mainly statistically. Sometimes when I give a talk to a technical audience in particular, somebody always asks that same question, mm -hmm. why, are, why are you doing this? Yes. And I point out to the audience, which is almost always standing room only, well, why are you all here? And the answer is everyone's interested yeah, in these yeah. ideas. And we see that reflected in entertainment and movies. It's, it's a, a, a concept that everyone is interested in. To assume that consciousness plays no role in the physical world is almost certainly wrong. It does play a role. Mm -hmm. The degree to which it plays a role is still an open question. But the experiments we're doing is a way of taking what normally is thought of as a psychological issue I mean, parapsychology is the word psychology in it, and in expanding it so that it's more relevant to physics. Maybe consciousness is as fundamental as energy, and it's, it wraps into the space-time in mm -hmm. some important way. So the metaphor I like to, to think of is that the, the, the fabric of reality, the universe as we know it, is made like a, like a woven material. There's a, a, a wharf and a woof. And the two parts of it have to come together, and that it's the intermixing of the two that creates the universe as we perceive it and at, at large. Well, the, the wolf and wharf are energy and matter and consciousness. One without the other actually wouldn't is not enough. So maybe we're talking about something like a complementary relationship. Mm -hmm. that, that you, you can't have just consciousness alone, and you can't have just mm -hmm. matter and energy alone. You need the combination of both in order to create... Mm -hmm. reality as we experience it. I think that's the, the most parsimonious explanation for the kinds of effects that we see. Because if, if, it's, if consciousness is completely separate from matter and energy, then there's no way to interact, in which case we, we, would never, we, we wouldn't be able to extract the two. But when you do experiments that involve effects of consciousness at a distance, which all of our experiments involve, mm -hmm. whether it's to a living system or a non-living system, or even if it's just clairvoyance, it still involves something about an extended form of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Well, then it, it clearly is involved in the physical world in some way, but it is not the same. It's not of the same type. Yeah. Now, it may be that what we currently call spiritual or consciousness, we will eventually understand in physical terms, but the form of physicality that we understand at that point will be very different than yeah. what we understand today. And before we were talking about different kind of energies, and even in your experiments, you were saying that this link between the consciousness and the, your systems would be non-energy, not the type of physical energy here. But how, how do you get this idea? Well, every time we've used uh, conventional instrumentation to try to pick up the, the, the effects, we, well, first of all, we, like any instrument, only picks up things indirectly. So we don't measure it directly. In this case, if we're talking about something like the subtle energies that people feel within their body, 
so far, conventional instrumentation doesn't pick that up, and, which is one of the reasons why the mainstream is so skeptical about mm -hmm. it, because we can't measure it doesn't exist. And yet it does exist within the body, so something is measuring it. The, the challenge then is, uh, well, how do we begin to understand something that we can measure as a living system, but we don't have the right instruments yet? Mm -hmm. Well, for one thing, I, I always uh, try to remind myself and others that just because we can't measure something yet with an instrument doesn't actually mean anything because science is new and we're always discovering new ways yes, of measuring the absolutely. world. And in particular, if you take everything known from science about the way the world is and you take everything that we have yet to learn and you make a fraction out of it, the fraction will be so close to zero absolutely. that it, we don't know anything yet. Absolutely. You know, it's amazing that we can do yes. anything. So at some point, we will discover ways of probably objectively or quasi-objectively mm -hmm. measuring what people have called subtle energies mm -hmm. or prana or chi, all those, those same living system kinds of feelings that people have. And at that point, we'll begin to take the process like science has done in many other places and understand what we're dealing with. At this point, I don't think we have a very good idea. And part of this may be because uh, our ordinary senses are very adept at showing us the separation between objects. But we know that at a deep physical level, there are no separations. So what we see is something that is happening at a distance, in a sense, maybe an illusion. That there is no distance at a deeper level. Mm -hmm. In which case, you can think of it as an informational link or as an entanglement-like connection that transcends, it appears to transcend distance or time, uh, but actually at a deeper level, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's like it's all here, it's all right there, it's all right here, all the time. And so we have, we have to think beyond the way that our, our senses are essentially fooling us into imagining that everything is as separate as it appears.